Okay, now let's jump into our message this morning. Today is the conclusion of our Anchored series where we've been working our way through the Apostles' Creed. And last week we talked about the, the beauty of the church, of what it means, uh, as Jay mentioned earlier, what it means to be built together as the body of Christ. And we saw that God... It's this beautiful imagery where God is the master builder, Jesus is the cornerstone, and we are the living stones, and as we move toward the center, as we move towards being a part of the core of a local body of believers, that God is doing something incredibly cosmic and profound, and the spirit of the living God is dwelling and moving in our midst, that we literally become a spiritual house that houses the spirit of the living God. And just to absolutely celebrate the steps that you took last week, we had a call to action to, to move toward that center, to get involved, to get plugged in and built into the body of Christ. You guys, 850 of you responded by filling out the connection cards and turning them in. 331 of you wanted to serve. That's 39% of 850 people. I want you, that's mind blowing. 340 of you signed up to get connected in life groups, and uh, 177 of you marked yourselves as new or uh, new-ish, which I'm not sure exactly what new-ish is, but new or new-ish, and 126 of you uh, gave us that glorious smiley face, meaning you are already connected in a life group, and you're already serving, which we are so thankful for you. So thank you for your incredible response. I wanna celebrate you, thank you so much. And I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled for not only how Grace Chapel as a whole is gonna be blessed by your involvement, but how God is going to grow you and shape you and disciple you and help you grow to maturity in Christ. Now just so you know, uh, there are still, there's still room for you to sign up and get plugged in in life groups or serving in a variety of capacities. In the front of your seat, if you missed last week, there's a connection card that you can fill out. We also have a digital form that you can fill out online if you wanna do it that way. There's multiple ways to get built into the body of Christ and it's radically important, especially in the day in which we are living. Amen, somebody? Amen, all right. Now, today... We are going to read the Apostles' Creed at the end of the message to conclude our series on uh, Anchored. And the two phrases that we're gonna talk about today out of the Apostles' Creed are this. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And I'm, I'm so excited about this. I, I hope you are ready to be encouraged this morning because we've got some good news. Let's talk about the resurrection of the body. If you brought your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and hold your place there. 1 Corinthians 15 addresses our bodily resurrection. In fact, the whole chapter pretty much deals with that specific issue. And I want to encourage you this week when you're gathering in life groups or when you're spending time in the Word alone that you read through the rest of the chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, but for today... We're gonna read verses 42 through 44. The Apostle Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. He says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, and what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body, and if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now when it's saying spiritual body, it's not saying that we're some disembodied spirits when we're raised, it, it's saying that the physical and the spiritual are in tandem with one another, in perfect harmony with one another. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever had this moment in your life, and anybody that is maybe 25 and under, this does not apply to you, where you go to bed at night and nothing is wrong. You don't hurt, there's no pains, there's no aches, nothing. And you wake up the next day and somehow you've pulled three muscles and can barely breathe. <laughs> like I've had this moment multiple times in my 30s and I'm thinking, I went to sleep. 
All I did was go to sleep and I've got a sleeping injury. I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> and in fact, this is actually, apparently, it's a common experience in our communication team we were talking about. There's a bunch of memes about this, so I wanted to share some with you this morning. I mean, that pretty much sums it up right there. There's another one, and I, th okay, so in your 20s, I fell asleep backwards on a coffee table last night and woke up in time to run a 5K. In your 30s, I bought the wrong pillow, put me in hospice. <laughs> Anyone in the 50 plus crowd is going, you just wait. <laughs> you have no idea. But there comes a time in life when you stop referring to your knees as your right knee and your left knee, but it's your good knee and your bad knee. <laughs> right, or when you go to sit down in a chair and you sound like a buffalo in heat. <laughs> Not that I know what that sounds like. <laughs> the point is, our natural bodies are perishing. Our natural bodies are perishing. They're falling apart. They're breaking down. And in fact, the writer of Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he writes about this in some poetry. And you kind of have to read behind what he's saying because there's a bunch of imagery in here. But he says this. He says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble. The keepers of the house, that's talking about your arms and your hands trembling. And the strong men are bent and the grinders, which are your teeth, cease because they're few. And those who look through windows are dim. That means your vision is going. And the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low. And one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and the terrors are in the way. And the, the almond tree blossoms. That's talking about your hair turning white in old age. And the grasshopper drags itself along. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> And desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets before the silver cord, that's your spine, is snapped or the golden bowl is broken, that's your head, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel is broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. Now, really, obviously, interesting, but some accurate information in there in Ecclesiastes 12. But I want you to think about this. And not to discourage us at all, but I, I want you to think about that any physical healing that you experience in this life, it is a temporary healing. It, it is a delaying of the inevitable. Isn't that encouraging? It, it is delaying the inevitable. And it's not your eternal healing, it's a temporary healing in this moment here and now. And it's beautiful, it's glorious, it displays the power of God in this life. It glorifies him, it magnifies him here and now, but it ultimately is a delaying of the inevitable. And think, think about Lazarus. I, I thought about Lazarus in a totally different way this week. So think about Jesus saying, Lazarus come forth, and Lazarus comes out of the tomb. Right, everybody before this moment is mourning, they're sorrowful, Lazarus comes out, and Mary and Martha in this whole crew is celebrating and they're glorifying God, and I'm wondering if Lazarus wasn't just like, why? Because now he's gotta die twice. He's gotta grow old and die again. Like everybody is celebrating and he's thinking, why God, why me, you know? And our bodily resurrection, Paul tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, he says, what is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. And a seed that is sown has to die in order for something new to grow out of it, in order for something beautiful to be born. 
John Ortberg said this, he says, death is the prerequisite to resurrection, the new life God intends. In other words, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've surrendered your life to Christ, on the other side of death, is, and the coming resurrection means no more backaches, no more knee pain, no more depression, no more tums, no more seasonal allergies, no, listen, no more social distancing. Right, no need for medicine, no mental illness, and we're like, yes, Lord, take me now. Like, I'm ready, let's go. Right, this is why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, he says, so in light of all of this, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It cannot be compared. We have no idea how beautiful, how wonderful it's gonna be as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're fading away, they're passing away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We don't lose heart. Even though our bodies are aching and perishing, we know that God is doing and will do a complete work in us and through us where our ultimate healing is gonna come. And it, listen, it won't just be a resuscitation. It, it won't just be like Lazarus being brought back into this perishing body. It's not renovating a sinking ship. That's not what God does. It is a resurrection into an entirely new, perfect, imperishable, heavenly, eternally body. Is anybody happy about that? See, no other religion gives us anything like this. Because in every other religion, it's the physical is evil and we need to, be, we need to do away with it. Or it's that the physical is all there is and that's all we can live for. But it's only Christianity that says, no, it's the physical and the spiritual that are brought together at that bodily resurrection in perfect harmony for all eternity and it's a beautiful thing to be celebrated. We're not gonna float around to some disembodied spirits. Listen, we are going to dance. I can't dance, but when I get my heavenly body, I'm gonna try. We're gonna laugh, we're gonna eat, like Jesus is raised from the dead and he appears to the guys in the room, scares them half to death, and he says, I just conquered death, hell, and the grave. I'm hungry, give me something to eat, right? And they give him fish and he's eating food. We're gonna eat, we're gonna drink, we're gonna play, we're gonna embrace and be embraced. We're gonna have the physical and the spiritual in perfect harmony with one another forever. And when we are raised, in that new bodily resurrection, we're raised into the life everlasting. So let's talk about that for a moment. If you think back to when you were little, we all have these memories of certain times or certain places or uh, certain things that we did that are nostalgic. They're a, a, a reminder of something beautiful that we got to experience when we were younger. And it, it, it sort of evokes this emotion that there's this longing, there's this joy about it, but there's almost like this sorrowful longing to go back and experience that again. It's like this unnameable emotion. And the truth is, every single one of us, whether you're a Christian or not, is longing for something that we can't quite put our finger on. We can't quite name it, we can't quite say what it is, whether it's longing for a family that we've never had, or longing for a place that we've never been to, or longing for a connection or a relationship that we've never got to experience, or a beach that we've never been to, or a mountain we've never climbed, or a home we never got to eat in and laugh in and play in. And what's interesting is when you read Revelation 21, what John writes to the early believers it is absolutely incredible, and it paints the picture for us. In verses one through seven, John writes this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. 
And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. To the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Isn't that awesome? This is what life everlasting looks like. Our longings, those deepest longings, will be fulfilled forever. That, that nostalgia, that unnamed thing that we're hoping for, that we just, we long for and we desire, will be totally fulfilled. In verse four, it's just so packed with meaning. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. A good father taking care of his children loving his children, and in this we see the gentleness, the tenderness, the intimacy of God, the love that he has for you and for me in that moment, wiping away every tear. He loves you more than you could possibly fathom, and he's gonna take care of all of our sorrows. He's gonna wipe away every tear. Also in verse four, and death shall be no more. No more funerals, no more tragedies, no more breaking stories or gone way too soon. They're gone forever. Death has been destroyed. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. No more, listen, no more grief. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more crying. Look, have you ever had somebody that you loved and care about that was experiencing chronic pain that you could do nothing about. It's awful. You feel totally helpless and all you wanna do is make it better and you can't. It's an awful feeling, not only as somebody that you love in, in pain, but you are utterly powerless to do anything about it. Listen, that is gone forever. It's gone forever. For the former things have passed away, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Say all things new. All things new. He's making all things new. It's incredible. Listen, do you realize that whatever you believe to be true about your future will drastically affect how you live today? Whatever you believe is coming on the other side of death is gonna drastically affect how you live today. Let me give you an example. So let's say, um, let's say you take two people, all right, and you put them in a dingy basement. It's a little sadistic, but that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put them in the basement. And you say, okay, for a full year, for 10 hours a day, every day, you have to assemble and disassemble this table over and over and over again, every day for a whole year for 10 hours a day, and it's an Ikea table, so it's like especially torturous. <laughs> 10 hours a day, every day for a full year. And you tell them both that. And you say to the one guy, you say, okay, at the end of that year, if you complete it, at the end of that year, you are gonna earn an annual salary of $20,000 a year. So do this for a year, and at the end of that, you complete it, you get $20,000 a year for the rest of your life. And you say to the other guy, at the end of the year, if you complete it, you are gonna get $20 million annual salary for the rest of your life. What's gonna happen? The first guy, about two or three months in, is gonna say, man, I don't need this. This is so dumb, this is so pointless, this is so tedious, I can't stand it, I can't take it anymore, I quit, I'm out of here. 
while the other guy is whistling while he's putting the table together. He's like, this isn't tedious at all. This is wonderful. I'm so happy. They are experiencing the same exact circumstances, but what they believe about their future is totally different. And we see this with the story of Christians having to go through this horrible experience during the Holocaust in concentration camps. People that believe the truth of what comes after death have hope. They're able to persevere. They're able to maintain their sanity somehow in the middle of that. And see, what we see is John, when he was writing this, he was writing this to early Christians that would have read these writings. They were suffering in ways that we can't possibly imagine, far worse than anything that we have experienced or will experience. The Roman emperor Domitian was the first emperor to begin widespread, large-scale persecution of Christians. He would take their homes from them and plunder their homes. Christians were sent into the arena to be torn apart by wild beasts. I mean, they were suffering in horrendous ways. And listen, just to help us grasp this, I'm not trying to be morbid, but Christians were impaled on spikes and while they were alive, were lit on fire. And yet, there is record of those early Christians singing hymns while they're being killed, forgiving those who are killing them. They suffered in ways that we can't even imagine, but in their suffering, they had hope. They had hope. Poise, they had courage, they had boldness, they were rooted, they knew what their future held. And they know, they knew who held their future. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, said this He says, The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Why? Because people on the outside of the church saw the composure, the love, the grace, the hope, the living hope of people looking at death in the face and welcoming it with a boldness and courage they had never seen before. Facing death with a grace that they'd never seen in anyone ever before in history. What gave them that courage? It was what they believed to be true about their future. They had a living hope. It wasn't some blind wish, but because they knew the reality that that awaited them on the other side of of death. It's life everlasting, resurrection bodies, no more pain, no more sorrow, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, glorious, coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. That's what awaits us. Now look, you're probably not gonna be thrown to lions in an arena with a crowd full of cheering people anytime soon. But every single one of us has something weighing us down. Something that we look out at at life and say, God, I don't know how I'm gonna make it through this. I don't know how I'm gonna endure. I don't know how I'm gonna persevere. I don't know how I'm gonna navigate these difficulties or problems. We all have those things, but if you believe in the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem that is in your future, no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, that God himself will be in our midst it's, it's not a faith issue anymore. He's right there. He's gonna be in our midst. and He will be our God. We will be his people, his sons and daughters. If you believe that, not on some sort of mental gymnastics level, not as some blind wish, but as an absolute certainty that this is what life everlasting looks like. If you believe that, listen, there is nothing you can't face in this life. There is nothing you can't persevere through and make it through in this life. If you believe that is in your future, there's nothing you can't endure. All of our deepest longings will be fulfilled. All of our deepest sorrows will be swallowed up. It is an absolute certainty. And you say, well, Rob, how can you be so certain that's in our future? I'll tell you how. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ makes it a certainty. Scripture says that Jesus, his death and resurrection, it was the first fruits. It was an installment, the first installment, meaning there's more to come, meaning we will be raised one day because Jesus was raised. Revelation 21, 6, it says, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. 
Now what's interesting is back in John chapter four, Jesus meets this woman at the well. And many of you know the story, she had this mess of a life. And Jesus comes along and he says, hey, if you drink from the water that I give you, you'll never, you'll never thirst again. And she thinks he's talking about physical water. But he was talking about something much broader than that, much greater than that. And what he was saying to her is, I can give you a foretaste of what it's gonna be like to drink from the river of life in the new heavens and the new earth. I'm gonna give you a foretaste of what's to come, of the living water. I'm gonna give you a a taste of what that's gonna be like. So what does that mean? Well, it means this. It means that the deepest longings of your soul are gonna be fulfilled. It means that all of that sorrow and grief is is gonna be swallowed up. Your longing for love, for connection, for value, will be eternally satisfied in that river and Jesus here and now offers us a foretaste of what that's gonna be like. See, even now you can get a taste of what the river of life is going to be and it's without payment, it's without cost. And you say, how can that be? Because on the cross, Jesus had his arms spread wide and he said a number of significant things but one of the things he said is I thirst, I thirst. And we know that it wasn't just a physical thirst, it was a cosmic thirst because immediately after, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What that tells us is that Jesus went thirsty. He experienced a cosmic thirst so that you and I would never thirst again. He took that on himself, what we deserved so that we could have what he deserved. It's this beautiful exchange that happens on the cross of Christ. See, Jesus is making everything new. He is the alpha, he is the beginning, he is the first fruits, the first installment, and eventually everything will be made new. And you need to realize that the resurrection of Jesus, listen, the resurrection of Jesus means that no matter what happens to you now, no matter what you experience in this life, it will only make you better. Whatever you experience, knowing that there's a resurrection coming, whatever sorrow, whatever grief, whatever difficulty, whatever hardship you experience in this life, it is only gonna make you better. And it's the death and resurrection of Jesus that that allows us, that allows Christians throughout the history of the church, listen, to look at death in the face and say, bring it on. Give me your worst. The lower you take me, the higher you'll raise me. Come on, grave, what do you got? And even if by chance you happen to kill me, you're just giving me an early promotion. You'll make me better than I've ever been before. English poet George Herbert said it this way. It's a beautiful quote. He says, death used to be an executioner, but the gospel has made him just a gardener. So church, This morning, on this Sacrament Sunday, we're gonna take some time as the family of God and we're gonna remember the victory that was won for us, the victory that we could never win for ourselves that Christ has won for us on the cross. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, says the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread and listen, He had given thanks. Knowing the suffering that was awaiting him, he gave thanks because he knew what was awaiting him on the other side. He gave thanks and broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And it's Christ's sacrificial death, his body broken for us, his blood shed for us that has won for us a victory we could never win for ourselves. I'm gonna go ahead and invite the worship team to come up and join us. And listen, oftentimes when we take communion, oftentimes it becomes this, um, and there's times for this, but it becomes this kind of somber, reflective, almost sorrowful moment. 
But listen, communion is a celebration. It's, it's a joyous celebration of what Christ has won for us, of the victory that he won for us. And so church, we're gonna celebrate during communion this morning. We're gonna praise, we're gonna sing, we're gonna shout, we're gonna dance. We are gonna celebrate during communion. And as you, many of you have already found, the communion packets are underneath your seats. Go ahead and grab those if you haven't yet. I wanna invite you to stand with me. If you're watching online, you can stand wherever you're at. And if you're here, you wouldn't yet consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus. You have yet to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. I wanna invite you to forego communion. This is a sacred act of worship for those that have surrendered their lives to Jesus. And if you wanna find out more about what that might look like for you, I would love to talk with you right here after service today. I would love nothing more than to talk with you about what it would look like for you to surrender your life to Jesus today. So come talk to me after service. That is an open door. But for those of us that are followers of Jesus, we're going to celebrate the death of Jesus Christ, the victory that he won for us. And we're gonna do that. We're gonna read the Apostles' Creed together one last time in this series, and then we're gonna celebrate and take communion together. Amen, somebody? So take your cup, hold it up in the air. It's a celebration, y'all. Let's read the creed together. Let's say this. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen, amen. Let's take communion together and celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ.